Welcome to this presentation of the Rotary Club of North Bethesda, Maryland, USA. Our club was established in 1974. We meet every Friday morning at 7.45 a.m. and we often invite guest speakers to give presentations on all kinds of interesting subjects. Please contact us through our website at nbrotary.org. And thanks for watching. Our presentation today is by Scott Sklar. He is president of the Stella Group Limited, a strategic policy and clean technology optimization firm facilitating clean distributed energy utilization. Thank Scott? you very much. Great to, to be here and uh, meet you all. Um, <clears throat> So I, I teach these three courses and I do lots of public speaking and I could do any sub area as an entire all day course. <laughs> I, of course, I can't do that because I don't have the time, but I put together a PowerPoint, which I'm going to try to share my little screen here, if I can do that. And oh yeah, Microsoft PowerPoint. And, um, and there it is. And then it should be, oh, it says share. Okay, let's see if that works. Yep. You guys see my uh, PowerPoint there? Yes, we could. We do. Okay, I'm going to flip it up all the way. So I just want to say, since I was already described, my company's 20 years old. I've been in the field over 40, actually starting in the 1970s for 10 years in the U.S. Senate, where I became an energy aide. But that aside, my, I don't, I'm not a project developer. I actually work for the customer. I have projects on every continent, including Antarctica. And my job is to come in if they want clean energy to help them figure out what they want to do with commercially available and economic and reliable technology. And I blend technology. So uh, energy efficiency, fuel cells, geothermal heat pumps, heat engines, micro hydropower, the marine energy, uh, generation, tidal and wave, biomass, photovoltaic, small wind, solar thermal, solar daylighting, so all this kind of stuff. And as you heard, I also teach three interdisciplinary courses at GW, including the first course of the country on renewable energy and critical infrastructure. So I want to start this presentation by using a great colorful chart from McKinsey and Company, the international strategic analysis firm. Uh, of the 12 disruptive technologies that they saw on the planet. And as you can see on the top left is renewable energy, uh, obviously advanced gas and oil uh, exploration, which we call fracking, uh, advanced materials, which we are in a material science renaissance. In fact, the reason we can have wind turbines sitting in the ocean, which is acidic, salty, 700 times more dense than air and full of animals that can pit the metal is we've developed materials that can last 60 years in the water, which we couldn't even do 15 years ago, among other things. Uh, flip down a little on the left, energy storage. We are also in an energy storage renaissance. Not, not just battery materials, compressed air and liquids, flywheels, weights, thermal salts, uh, all, uh, pumped hydro, all sorts of things. And then on the right-hand side is all the sort of the Internet of Things related technologies. And what's odd about this, and what I want you to think about this morning, is I am hired in many cases to put in hybrid systems to independently power the Internet, the, the cell towers, the data centers, the fiber optic switching. And at the same time, I use that network to coordinate how my technologies work. So it's totally symbiotic. And we'll get into more analogies on that momentarily. So we are in a giant transformation, even though it was hard to believe in looking at Texas, which uh, uh, didn't necessarily achieve the transformation yet. But I want you to look and think about what grids we have today. We have actually lots of grids, not just electric grids. And one of the grids you are familiar with that wasn't around uh, when my hair was dark and when my hair was on my head was a cellular network. 
And our cellular networks are self-healing grids. What does that mean? It means that if a cell tower goes down, the, the, the phone system, the cellular network doesn't go down. The cell towers automatically triangulate and work around the dead cell towers. And cell towers die all the time. When a data center goes down on the internet, the internet doesn't go down. Other data centers in hundredths of a second uh, sense the loss and triangulate around the lost data center and compensate for it. What we are doing in electricity is what I call the third wave of self-healing grids. So that in, when a wire goes down or when a transformer blows or when a squirrel chews on a transformer, uh, the whole system should not go down as it does today. So what, what requires that are several things. One is a smarter grid, meaning you have sensors and controls that can understand. Most utilities, by the way, don't know if they have an outage unless they get a call from a customer. So we need to automate our grids so we know what's going wrong. The other thing we need to do is throughout the grid, along transmission lines, at substations, along distribution lines, and at the end user use of energy, we need to have lots of different kinds of energy production and energy storage so that we have the capability to provide power when, again, a transformer or a line goes down. Now, we can do that. And we do it today, it's just not universal. And in fact, that's what I do on corporate campuses all the time and military bases. We can do it. The technology exists. It's actually quite cost effective. And so, but that's, we need to move from those narrow end users to a common public purpose. And that's what the presentation sort of is about today. So I want to start, I'm using this DLO DLR chart from uh, Europe. This is the analytical group that uh, deals with uh, Germany's NASA. And uh, they did a study which shows how much renewable energy we have on this planet. And as you can see with solar energy, we have more than 2,500 times more energy than we can use on a planet any day or any year. Now, obviously it's not cost effective to access all of that energy, but with 20, uh, 2,850 times, uh, you just need a very small percent, frankly, to make a big impact. Wind, 200 times. Hydropower, one time. Wave and tidal energy, two times. Geothermal, heat from the earth, 9,000 degrees in the center of the earth. And we could take that heat and create steam just as we use uranium, coal, oil, and natural gas. And we do. And of course, biomass, and biomass is, in this case, biodegrading matter our sewage, animal manures, dead trees, uh, food waste, things like that, the lawn clippings, 20 times. So we have a huge resource base. I want to say this correctly, huge. And the whole point here is to show you that the resource base is astounding. Now, it's not evenly distributed all over the world, but actually in the United States of America, it pretty much is. And we'll get into that in a second. So since you're into dealing with climate, I thought I'd put in my own, um, my own bias, and I have three maxims here I want to uh, lay out for you. One is I see all this nonsense of the world working totally on solar, or totally on wind, or all that. That's just ridiculous. What you want is the entire portfolio of renewable energy, energy storage, and energy efficiency. And we're going to get into energy efficiency, which is the most important, uh, to do that. If you don't do that, if you read these studies which try, try to push one technology or one or two like solar and wind, you're going to have land use problems and other climate effects because you're overusing the technologies. So one is you need an entire portfolio of what I call all the zero emission technologies. The other issue is number two, is that 
it is always less expensive to save energy than generated from any source. And I don't care what that source is. Again, natural gas, coal, nuclear oil, and any of the renewables, it's still always less expensive to save a kilowatt or a megawatt than generate it. So, and it's always less expensive. I have a slide on that I'll show you in a second. So one of the things we really have to do is to, to, is to educate, regulate, incentivize so that the marketplace, the building owners, the homeowners, the business owners, the vehicle owners are saving every bit of energy they possibly can economically and then figure out how to energize it. Uh, and the other issue is I, I see a lot of studies and in some cases I, I'm an environmentalist and I, I've been on boards of environmental groups, but this whole issue of biomass. Biomass is not garbage burning. Garbage is not biomass. Biomass is the organic waste we have on the planet. And what happens to those organic wastes is they biodegrade into methane. Methane is a 25 to 30 times more potent greenhouse gas than carbon. It, it lasts only a few hundred years in the atmosphere, so a lot less than carbon but it is one of the superchargers of climate change. So what you want to do is intercept that natural breakdown where you can. Human sewage, animal manures, food processing waste, contaminated grains, uh, dead trees, all those kinds of things that just lay around and biodegrade are not only great energy sources, but they are also great fertilizers, great materials, great chemicals. So we are just we are just in the infancy of understanding all of this. But I do a lot of systems uh, called anaerobic digestion systems on farms and industrial campuses. It's sort of crazy not to do it. So. Uh, the first chart, uh, little, uh, and I have the links here, and I will share this with your uh, your organization so you have access to this PowerPoint. But this is uh, the American Council for Energy Efficient Economy is in Washington D.C. It's sort of the global think tank on energy efficiency, and they put out a report two years ago that basically says the U.S. could uh, energy efficiency could cut U.S. energy use and greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by 2050. It absolutely can. And, and the most interesting part of that is it can be done cost effectively and faster than anything else we can do. So to me, it is sort of crazy to not think about energy efficiency. And I have a Lawrence Berkeley lab slide I'll tell you on how low that cost is. Um, now, this is a few years old, but also from ACEEE, and the only real difference here is coal has gone below 20% now of our electric generation, and renewables has gone just slightly above 20%. So that's the big changeover. Everything else is pretty much stacked. Natural gas is probably up 4% too. So everything stacked. So renewables and natural gas up. Coal is crashing. Nuclear is stagnant and going down, really. And so, and we use very little petroleum in our electric generation in the United States. And this is a great story. And for those of you alive in the mid 70s when we had the oil embargo, 40% of our electricity was based on oil and most of that imported. And now it's 1%. How great is that? So, that's a success story. So this is out of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. This is the federal entity that looks at, again, uh, utility scale power, and it looks at what goes on the electric grid only. So a lot of the projects I do, by the way, don't go on the electric grid. They go on to the uh, industrial park or the corporate campus or the military base or the university campus. But in this February 2021, um, three quarters of 
all electricity coming onto the U.S. grid, meaning new electricity, um, that was and came on in the year 2020, uh, 78 percent was renewable energy, and so so it's not you see, and and frankly the rest was gas, so it's 99 percent. So you know the I mean coal, oil, you know, and nuclear, other than one plant being built, is not real. So we in the United States, through markets primarily and through state regs, are, are driving this trans transformation. It's sadly not fast enough to deal with a lot of what we need to deal with uh, addressing greenhouse gas emissions yet, but it's a very good start. We have a very good story. And by the way, I want to point out, I, I, I didn't do, have put out an international perspective for you in this presentation, but in fact, uh, over fifth, since 2016, so starting four years ago, the majority of electricity coming on the global grid is over 50% in renewable energy, for, uh, coming from renewable energy. So that's also good news on the planet. So this is the International Energy Agency based in Paris. Uh, it's out of the G11. And this is a chart that they put out showing um, mandatory energy efficiency policies by country. And as you can see, about 30% of the world has uh, some kind of mandatory energy efficiency. Uh, China, over, China and the United States are the only two countries over 50%. Uh, Japan nearly. Uh, European Union on down, there you see the other countries. So our country, and believe it or not, China are leaders in energy efficiency. Japan came on board when they, of course, had the Fukushima meltdown and they closed all their nuclear power plants. They needed desperately to not import all the energy, so that's how they, they started following suit. Um, this is the Berkeley study that came out, and basically what it's saying is if you save a kilowatt of energy, it costs you about three cents and you know a kilowatt hour. And so in Arlington, Virginia here, we're paying around nine to 11 cents. Uh, Maryland, uh, you're about so the 11 cents range. So, <laughs> so it's always less expensive. Let's say three cents is always less expensive than nine cents. I know you all know that. And you're all math whizzes. So again, it is crazy not to do this. Um, so I, I was asked to sort of talk about, can we go 100% renewable energy? And yes, we can. And we can with the technologies we have today, and we can do it economically. Uh, and so this is one such uh, study uh, that was published uh, that basically says there are no fundamental technical or financial barriers. And uh, that's true. And so there are, uh, uh, you know, I give my students 36 studies that have taken together show this can happen. And it's, again, with the blend of technologies. So uh, now this is the, the, the article I had that came out in April of last year that says renewables bring 72% of new global power. I want to remind you, this is new power coming onto the grid. We're not anywhere near that in, in the all, all entire generation. But uh, so this one was looking backwards to 2019. And again, 176 gigawatts or 176 nuclear power plants worth of renewable power came on the grid. 72% of it was from renewables. And most of that, by the way, came from solar and wind. And of course, we want to move to some of the others as well. Uh, this is this year, February uh, 23rd, 2021, and basically this is Bloomberg New Energy Finance. It's looking at um, a, a possibly 160 gigawatts to 209 gigawatts coming onto the planet um, in uh, 2021, and, and they see it surging 22 to 2023. All good news, even during the pandemic, these industries and frankly my business were booming it was hard to believe i of course didn't think it would happen at all uh so 
that these technologies are finally coming of age. And I, by the way, I never thought I'd see it. Um, this is an article in 2019 that shows that uh, these advanced uh, clean energy technologies came uh, about $106 trillion worldwide a couple of years ago. And that's uh, and it's going higher up. It's a very fast trajectory. So this is a great uh, map on a study done by the Institute of Local Self-Reliance. And the basis of this study, it was saying, with technology we have today and renewable resources we have in the United States, how much could we produce on our grids economically? That's the point. This is the point, economically. And as you can see, 32 states produce, can produce way more power from the sustainable renewable energy resources they have. And of course, you can. Now, this did not have in this study offshore wind and marine, uh, marine energy, tidal and wave power. And the moment you bring in offshore wind, there's a big movement in New Jersey and New York, um, for instance. Uh, you will see a, a whole rate, the, the East Coast states will all be uh, about 100% uh, from uh, that offshore water resource. So, and of course, we have transmission lines that can send to from the states that have to the states that don't. So at any rate, that is uh, the resource base, the economic resource base, again, and with technology we have today. So this is no future posturing. Uh, today, this is a 2018 chart put out by American Wind Energy Association of the percentage of electricity in each state. Now, this is a couple of years old, so you heard about the Texas meltdown with wind producing uh, 20%. It's 15.9% there. But uh, again, you know, 20 years ago, these technologies really weren't around. And wind today is the lowest cost electric producer on the planet. There is no technology that can produce electricity uh, lower than wind. Now that doesn't, you know, but let's put that in context. Wind doesn't blow 24 hours a day. And it mostly blows at night. And except for being a teenager, I don't use a lot of electricity at night anymore. So generally what we're doing in the Midwest is we're shoving it westward where it's earlier so that we solve the electric needs of the West Coast, uh, more frankly, a lot more than the Midwest. Texas is a little different because, again, they have their sort of detached grid, and I think that's going to change pretty quickly. So that's what you see. In the next 20 years, you're going to see offshore wind primarily on the East Coast, though some on the West Coast, particularly Oregon, Northern California, and you'll see the same numbers. And I think wind naturally will fall somewhere between 15 and 25% for most of the United States. And it will be low cost. The other benefit, though, is, and we'll get into this momentarily, is energy storage of all types is coming in. It is now at cost parity today. And so instead of worrying about an electron blowing at 2 a.m. in the morning, and trying to figure out what you do with it, you can save it and use it during the day, like for your air conditioning load when you really need it. So, and I have more data here. So this is a Navigant study, uh, 2019, which basically just lays out uh, renewable energy uh, continues to be less than natural gas and coal. It is true. Um, uh, and uh, I put some more data from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. I want to talk a little about storage. Everybody focuses on batteries, but actually pumped hydro is the lowest cost energy storage on the planet. And, and aside from it being, uh, this is saying it'll be $350 billion industry by 2024, it's already 300, uh, $300 billion. Uh, this is the pumped hydro being used in the world today. And there's quite a lot of it. And these are in gigawatts. So it's to think of a gigawatt as a nuclear power plant worth of power. So China, Japan, the United States are the, um, the top world leaders on it. And basically what you're doing is you're taking cheap nighttime electricity. Uh, and you have power plants that cannot be shut off, particularly nuclear plants, for instance. 
everybody's sleeping. You're not using a lot of power. So what you do and hydro, uh, hydro dams, same thing. They're running hundred percent of the time and at night you have to use the power. So what you do is you pump water up a mountain or a hill or into a tank for that matter. And when you need electricity, you turn a valve and let it run down a pipe and go through a generator and generate electricity. It's uh, environmentally benign. It is very efficient. Uh, it doesn't waste water at all. And um, it's a very cost effective storage medium. And we use, you know, uh, some cases now we're starting to use weights or compressed air and liquids and tanks to do the exact same thing as pump storage. Some wonderful projects now around the world, also quite cost effective. And you notice Australia that's had a lot of outages due to fires and intense heat because of climate change. They're uh, planning and to do a lot with pump storage. So I put a map here of the least expensive method for generating electricity. This came out of the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Notice you don't see a lot of coal, the little black there, uh, because uh, everything is, the reason coal is below 20%, which was uh, just eight years ago above 50%, this is a radical transformation, is it's just too expensive. And so uh, the green area, natural gas, of course, very uh, uh, low cost fossil, I know the cleanest of the fossil. Uh, but wind and solar are there as well. And of course, I have more intense uh, maps with geothermal and biomass and the water technologies. So just to show you where solar's come, this is an international tender last year. And so this Japanese uh, conglomerate made a bid in, in gutter in the Arab Emirates. And they're, they have for under two cents a kilowatt hour. You cannot do a gas plant under six cents a kilowatt hour. So, and it's not just there, this is Los Angeles uh, and, uh, and uh, Nevada Power. And we did a, uh, uh, a two cents uh, a kilowatt hour solar photovoltaics with batteries. And again, the lowest cost gas plant that they could have gotten was about five cents. So also less expensive than dorm. So solar and, and batteries and wind and batteries together in starting in 20, actually 1998 uh, are lower costs in many cases than our conventional choices. Now you have issues. You need a lot of land for solar and we're going to talk about that. And this is just an art, another article. This is uh, Carnegie Mellon, a study on uh, looking at solar plus storage. And basically they're, they're just redefining again what I just told you that it's becoming a lower cost choice. I want to also talk about batteries. We all talk about lithium ion batteries and lithium ion batteries are the dominant technology in automobiles and in our electronic appliances like cell phones and laptops. But they, I work with 11 different kinds of battery materials in the market commercially available now. They all have come down about 60% over the last five years and they're about to come down another 21%. Uh, so there are all different kinds of batteries. And I picked this article because it has sulfur flow batteries, hydrogen batteries, zinc bromide batteries, uh, you know, magnesium batteries. There are nickel batteries. There are vanadium batteries, uh, carbon supercapacitor batteries, and now aluminum batteries. And aluminum batteries are very exciting. I'm working with them in uh, the military. Uh, Apple just built a plant for their cell phones. Uh, aluminum is the third most common metal on the planet. Uh, the battery is 97% recyclable. It's a 20-year battery. And unlike lithium batteries, it does not have thermal runaway. It cannot catch fire. So I'm gonna, you're going to see aluminum batteries, I think, taking over the market in a decade or so. So uh, we have lots of battery materials. So I, you know, I hear, you know, I'm reading these articles about, oh, will we have enough lithium? Well, yeah, we're going to, we have tons of lithium. But the issue is, is lithium going to be the dominant battery forever? No, not at all. And not in your lifetime. So the, the point being is we have lots of technology choices because of the first slide. We are in a material science renaissance. 
So I'm not going to go through all 36 studies. I just don't even have the time to do that, and I have to end for questions. So i am just listed all these studies, and this is a Greenpeace study with DLR. I showed you the chart that we could be 100% be renewables by 20, 2090. National Renewable Energy Laboratory uh, reduced carbon emissions by uh, so about 80% cost effectively. By 2030, 57% energy efficiency, 43% energy efficiency. Uh, Google or .org did a study. Could we have uh, cut carbon emissions down 48%? It would cost our economy 4.4 trillion, but we will recruit 5.4 trillion in savings. Uh, so these are all solid, well done studies. And this is the National Energy Study, and notice that to cut. 80% reduction in greenhouse gases, which is the blue line. Uh, you, you're going to do um, energy efficiency, the big wedge on the top, which is 57%, because you already learned it's more cost effective and faster, and then renewables uh, for the other 43%. And I have listed all the different supports. I want to talk about geothermal. MIT did a great study. It shows that we could meet a minimum, this conservatively, 10% of U.S. electric needs which in a country our size is more than most countries on the planet use for all their energy. And half of that geothermal uh, resource is under the Appalachians. Uh, so it's not just west uh, in like in Nevada. Concentrated solar power from the desert, 24 hour power using molten salt and using concentrators. We have about three gigawatts now in the United States, uh, but China has 10 gigawatts. Uh, uh, two gigawatts in Morocco, two gigawatts in South Africa, about a gigawatt being built in Australia. Uh, uh, Spain has three gigawatts. So it's going on all over the world. It's becoming very cost effective. And there you don't have the land use problems as much as you do in other, air, other uses of solar, like solar photovoltaics. And it has very minor impact on, you can still have the desert taught us to walking around quite nicely under the concentrators. So uh, water power, this is the number 13 here in the middle. Uh, this is the Edison Elect uh, Electric Power Research Institute of the Utilities, National Hydro Association, looking at, we could, uh, we have 88,000 existing dams, of which about a third of those 88,000 in the United States have the, are technically sound, structurally sound, and you can add turbines to it. And they're, they do not chop up fish. They have little fish ladders. And uh, it's a great re zero energy resource. And you're not building new dams, which I'm not a big fan of, but existing dams that are up, why not? So, uh, and waste heat. I want to talk about waste heat, number 14. Uh, this is Department of Energy study, Oak Ridge National Labs. 8% of U.S. electricity can be just displacing taking the waste heat of one application and using it in another application, or taking the waste heat off a power plant and shipping that, that heat somewhere else or into the po another power plant. So uh, I, use, uh, I take waste heat out of buildings to generate electricity all the time. Why dissipate it in, on, into the atmosphere? It's nonsense. It's ridiculous, actually. And so, and then these, the 31, 100% renewable energy, uh, studies, UN panel on climate change, about says 77%, uh, biogas, the Nicholas Institute. Uh, this one uh, sh shows we could meet, uh, come in. This is the newest one, number 35, uh, from uh, La Pinarata University in Finland. Uh, uh, great, greatly researched 100% renewable electricity study on the planet. Waste can meet 12% biodegradable waste. Uh, uh, meet, this is Columbia University study, 12%. You add all these together, and these are all cost effectively, and more importantly, they're sustainable. So, uh, and I can't just go through it. I had my um, students, though, take a look at all these studies on how much it could meet. Oh, this is Orlando. They have voted to, uh, to, uh, to go 100% renewable energy, and they become the 40th U.S. city to commit to 100% clean energy. Uh, Colorado City, this is Glenwood Springs, is set to become the latest US city to run 100% renewable energy. There are six other cities that are 
renewable energy at the moment in the United States. And so uh, states are driving uh, the trend. Um, and so and there are all studies. This Europe is doing the same thing. Um, and this is a, uh, some data on where renewable energy has finally outpaced coal. This was in middle of 2019. And Germany exceeds in last year 50% renewable energy use. Now, this was just a point in time. This is not every single day, but this is more than the coal, gas, and nuclear plants. Uh, and they're able to do that pre predominantly in the summer. Um, this is another study on biomass. I don't want to waste it. Hydrogen, taking, breaking water and using or breaking uh, methane, you can get hydrogen, which gives you high power. So where you may not use, be able to use electricity for trucking heavy-duty tractor-trailer trucks, you could use hydrogen. I mean, it's a very powerful fuel. The only emission out of the tailpipe is water. Uh, this is geothermal capacity in the United States. And so when you can see the Appalachians starting to come in the line. These are the biogas systems and landfill and wastewater systems and agriculture only. And so our and wastewater systems, what are we doing? We're pulling gunk out of water and we throw it on the ground, which contaminates the groundwater. Instead, turn it into biogas and power your wastewater systems and your community. Uh, these are the concentrated solar projects around, uh, you know, around the world being used. Uh, again, this is primarily desert technology. Um, energy efficiency gains from China. Microgrids. I'm going to end this with microgrids because I know I'm running out of time. A microgrid is taking several technologies, on-site technologies, in most cases renewables, sometimes diesel or natural gas, but mostly renewables, tied to a battery bank, using sensors and controls to coordinate together. And in Puerto Rico, for instance, where the hurricanes brought down the grid, uh, now we have a whole range of these microgrids where if the grid's going to fall, it in seconds detaches from the grid and powers the community or the buildings around it, 100%. And again, I've, we've used these on military bases. I do it all over the place. And now it's just becoming more common. And so uh, they're looking at... Uh, you know, uh, 31,000 megawatt capacity uh, coming on. And so that's, uh, you know, that's 31 nuclear power plants worth of microgrids coming on that didn't exist 10 years ago. And that's a very exciting development. So ending up, sorry I've gone over a little bit, but I do want to remind you, uh, I love the environmental group saying, you know, there's no planet B. There isn't. So I'm so excited and proud of you of making climate change an important issue. Uh, we are all on this planet, and uh, there's not a lot of places to go right now. So we have to make sure we can handle it. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any questions if I have any time left. Sorry. Oh, this, this was fantastic. Just fantastic. What do you see as the, the biggest impediments to making this happen, what, what you've been talking about? Well, I mean, I think there's three. One is uh, greed. Uh, obviously, there are industries and other uh, entities that make money from the conventional system. Uh, you're, a lot of you are old enough to remember, you know, uh, Ma Bell, we only had one phone company with a dial phone. And MCI said, no, I want to be able to get on the wires. And then the cell company said, no, we want to be able to do it wirelessly. And AT&T fought it until they were broken up. And then, of course, uh, lots of fights. So greed is one. Education is another one. You saw the Texas meltdown. The governor said it's the damn wind turbines. Well, actually, it was not the damn wind turbines. The nuclear power plant went down. Four natural gas plants went down. The natural gas pipeline pumps froze. And so... They had 60% of the electricity go down like crazy. The winter, now they had just had a winterize. We have wind turbines that work in Antarctica. In fact, I helped put them up. They work great all the time. You can make wind turbines that don't freeze. You just have to have create the, the, use the technology that makes sure they do not freeze. So the whole point being is education. 
The last one are regulations. We have regulations tied to old technology. And, uh, you know, the, and, you know, so when uh, AT&T was broken up, I don't know if you all remember this, but if you had an answering machine or a, a fax machine, with AT&T before it was broken up, you could not plug it in the wall. It was actually prohibited. People did it anyway. We broke the law. But Congress basically had to pass a rule, the right to interconnect, and set a technical standard, which is that little plug we use in the wall, uh, to standardize it. Well, the same thing has had to happen in each state for connecting to the grid. And the rules are getting harder and harder because the utility companies do not, frankly, want you or anybody else producing power. They want to produce the power. So, so it's regulation, education, and greed that's in the way. Could you tell us a little, a little bit about your house? So uh, my house was uh, my house, and then I built a two-story office building behind my house in Arlington, Virginia. By the way, I give weekly socially distanced tours. You're all welcome. I'm in North Arlington. Uh, they'll send you my uh, email. But... Um, my house uh, is two-story house. It has uh, solar water heating. Uh, it has uh, a photovoltaics on top of the house, solar electric for, with panels from uh, eight different companies. It all goes 100% into a giant battery bank because I started this before I could, you could ever, ever connect to the grid. I couldn't have connected to the grid even if I wanted to as we could do today. And I have a geothermal heat pump. And I use for air conditioning, which is my biggest electric load, 76% uh, less electricity than any of you do to air condition your building. So I have R38 insulation and double pane windows. So I, I have maximized, I have cut my electricity use by a third. And then have all these, and, and then uh, because of the energy efficiency, I actually use less electricity than any two-story house probably in North Arlington. And then I have all these different technologies. My back office building, is more, since it's more modern, has R50 insulation, super insulating windows, solar daylighting, solar electric roofing shingles, a small wind turbine, and a hydrogen fuel cell, all going into a battery bank. And again, it meets all its needs. I don't send any electricity to the grid. I do not take any electricity from the grid. And I've done, these are called zero energy buildings, meaning they do take zero energy from the grid. I've done 129 of them around the world. And most of them are between eight and 25 stories. I read all these ridiculous articles. You can't take large buildings off the grid. I do. I'm hired to. So, uh, you know, the, the technologies ask, are evolving. What are your, what kind of batteries do you use? Uh, I use different kinds what of batteries. What kind batteries. of batteries are you using? In my uh, home, I use absorbed glass matrix batteries, which are sealed 10-year warranty gel cells made in California. They're actually the most very common battery. And then uh, I use lithium ion in my back office building. That's caught. I have a question. Are you saying, given what the excellent presentation, but are you saying this is the end of the fossil fuel industry coming soon? Well, remember, most of the fossil fuel industry goes into transportation. And we are, electric vehicles are making a giant uh, strides. So it's going to take decades and decades for it to become a dominant industry. And fossil fuel coal is is about dead in the United States and in Europe. Uh, <clears throat> so you're going to start in, in the industrial economies. Coal is going to be zeroed out. Very few of us use oil, except now for Japan because of the nuclear plants being shut down. And natural gas, you're going to see. I, I view natural gas as a bridge fuel. So you're going to see it, but it's not going to be a dominant fuel in the decades, it's going to be a augmentation fuel to compensate for where renewables can't be maximized. So that's how the markets, because all these renewables are going to be less expensive, so the market's going to go towards them. But uh, natural gas is, can be a stabilizing fuel if, if it's done correctly. And then you won't have all the abuses we have with all the 
pushing, you know, the, trying to get every last molecule through fracking. And, you, you know, and I, I spent a whole day in my class on clean water. And I'm going to give you a fact. Uh, we have very few fresh water. We have, while, we, while the planet's mostly water, only 3% of it's pure. And only 1% of it can be actually accessed because the rest is in ice and, and in permafrost. So that 1% in the United States, the largest user of fresh water is energy. The extraction, conversion, and use of energy. The second largest is agriculture, where we get our food. Together, it's 90% of the water we used. And we are having less water because of the droughts and because of evaporation, because of climate change. So this issue that we can use thermal plants to generate our electricity like the old days, that's, that's fantasy. Uh, in decades, that will not be possible in, in over half the world. So we have to find technologies that don't have water. And that's the, gonna be the biggest problem for fossil fuels. Does, does fusion have any role in the future? I think it does, but it's uh, generations away. We're not even close to, to even sustaining it you know, in, in research. So, uh, and again, the, the other renewables are, <clears throat> are pr I, 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 my sense is you're gonna see the renewables come way before the fusion solution. So fusion over time might be good for the big cities you know, the, the Tokyo's, the Mexico cities of the world, you know, China has huge cities and, and use it for the higher energy source. But the, the, everybody else, I don't think it's going to be, it makes sense, actually. Scott, what would you, um, this was a great presentation. Thank you very much. Very good, uh, yes. What would you think would be the break-even point for somebody trying to go off the grid today, taking into account how energy costs for, current fuels are, are going to increase, et cetera. How many years would it take? And number two, have you recovered your costs? You, you've you put quite a bit into yes, your- Yes, I did. But the, the caveat to that, remember, I started, I'm so I'm crazy, as you can all uh, you know, see. And so I started in 1985 when no one was doing this. And have I recovered my cost? Absolutely. But it took 15 years to recover the costs. And uh, if I started today, it would take eight years. And of course, if you're doing it in a mortgage, um, you know, I mean, I'll get my renovation mortgage. I added a solar water heater and it added, you know, $11 a month to my second monthly payments on my second mortgage, but saved me back then $19 a month on my energy bill. Mm -hmm. So it was cash positive the day I did that. So. These days, you can do all, everything I described, including the energy efficiency, cost effectively that way. So as you're doing a renovation and financing it, you blend it else, else and the other, these energy innovations into that, and you're, you're cash positive the day you do it. So why aren't we doing that? And a lot of uh, localities, in Maryland in particular, are using uh, uh, property-assessed uh, financing they're called PACE, Property Assessed Clean Energy, uh, in commercial and in, some, in residential, depending on what county you live in. And that allows you to defer taxes, uh, property taxes, and put it into your energy savings. And so it's been a very great tool to achieve that cash positivity as soon as you can. Uh, Scott. Well, let me interrupt just real fast. So I, I know we're at the bottom of the hour, happy to stay on. Um, to answer more questions but if people need to go please we understand thank you very much for attending this morning and um people are welcome to stay on to continue to ask questions if scott has time i do thank you very much hi scott i just wanted to ask a question they what uh, in your opinion is uh, which of the battery technologies uh, that are available right now in the market would be the best battery to to it really depends how big you want it and where it is and what kind of footprint you are um right now we have a bunch of standardized systems not just coming from tesla which is very well known but lg uh so south korea sonnen from germany 
Um, so, I mean, we have 11 different packaged battery systems with warranties available now, either by lease, which means when the batteries are, when batteries are die, you just, the lease, the lessee takes them. You don't even have to worry about it or you can buy them. And, um, the, the batteries are a mixture of these days, um, primarily uh, absorbed glass matrix, lithium ion, lithium air, and nickel. And But you're going to see all the 11 choices in the marketplace over the next few years. There is no better. It really depends on what your lifestyle is and how much energy you're using it and when you need it. That tells you what kind of battery you need, really. Well, it's an outstanding presentation, and you killed two myths that green energy is economical, so it pays back. But in terms of the uh, addressing, is that China is almost 50% green energy now? How's the world trend? I mean, do you think uh, we'll make it? Uh, We're not making world... it fast enough. No, that's, that, that, our biggest problem is while if we didn't have climate change, this trajectory is fine. And it's moving and, you know, it takes time to build new technologies and develop distribution systems for it and, and installation and service. I'm doing a lot of workforce training projects. So we have people educated in the field. <clears throat> so, but it's not fast enough. So that means we really need to have a stronger international community and local government and local organizations like yours really fighting to get energy efficiency in schools, government buildings. Uh, California, now we have 17 states that do on-bill financing. This is amazing. Think about it. Half the people in the United States either lease or rent where they, they have their, their businesses or where they live. They don't own the building. So it's very hard to do this stuff to it. So what California started, but again, we have uh, actually about 17 states now. They have a deal with the utility, what's called on-bill financing. It's a regulation. Basically, it says if your building owner allows you, let's say you have a delicatessen or, uh, you know, or you're low income renting an apartment and you want to get a solar water heater, you can finance that on your bill. It's not on your credit rating. It's tied to the meter. If you don't renew your uh, your lease, it goes to the next person. And what's nice about it, just as I said, it's financed over time, so it's cash positive. Meaning, if you get that solar water heater, it will do just what I did. It may add 11 bucks a month more on your utility bill, but you'll save 29 bucks a month on your utility bill. So it's cash positive. It's not tied to your credit rating. It's tied to the meter. And I think that's going to be a transforming way uh, to, to, to do it. And I'm trying to convince the states to let the utilities make some money on this, not just be a, a banker uh, to do that. And uh, so everybody wins from the process. But, but we need innovations at the local level to scale it up. And I just want to point out, while there's a lot of stuff being done, there are always new ideas. And I know, you know, I see a lot of gray hairs in this... Uh, you know, on this uh, this this meeting today, and and non gray hairs, Sultan. I'm see you're looking good. Today. Me gray but, too. Uh, but okay. But the whole point being is, a lot of us bring things from our other past lives into this, and so there's right. always room for new ideas on how to do things. And frankly, the innovations coming from the local government, the you know the local group levels, who are just trying to get stuff done. And the more you do it, the more it excites other people to move forward. And that's why for the last 15 years, I've been doing these tours of my buildings, of primarily engineers and architects, but students, professors, because how do we expect people to change if they've never, ever seen the technologies you change to? It's, so, you know, it's sort of hard. So we, we need a lot of different tools to, to speed this up, to rev it up. Scott, we How need to popularize because these concepts are here. Scott, we need about a thousand of you around the country. <laughs> well, I did get my first vaccine shot on Sunday, so I might live out the year at least. Well, that's a good sign. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Scott, are Wonderful. you in relation to Jack Score? 
uh, I don't know, Jack, but all Sklars are related. So uh, uh -huh. we, we all come out of Russia and the Ukraine area. They kicked us out. And, uh, you know, I'm lucky they haven't kicked me out of the United States yet. So I'm feeling <laughs> good. Okay. Wonderful presentation. Well, Indeed, yes, really. thank you. And I will send my, um, to, to Kent, I'll send my uh, presentation out. And so, I, and you, so you guys can distribute it. And um, I'll also send my coordinates out as just separately that if they want to email it around, I answer every question. And I don't think there's anyone on the planet that has more studies on clean energy than I do. So there we go. Great. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Thank you, very much. Well, thank you again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Uh, the, the chats are, are really very positive. People really enjoyed it, Scott. Thank you very much. Have a good one. You Have too. You. Thank you.